All right, welcome to Flagship Digital Insights with myself, Ben Taylor, um, on the Yachting International Radio. Uh, today, we have Kim Adele Platts on with us, uh, talking about remote working, remote leadership. Uh, Kim, if you'd like to introduce yourself uh, so that everyone in our audience knows uh, who this is coming from, uh, that would be amazing. Fantastic, and thanks, Ben, so much for having me. I really appreciate it. So uh, my name is Kim Adele Platts. I'm a leadership coach and also an international speaker and author on leadership and particularly leading with kindness, humanity and courage in times of crisis, of which clearly with the amount of remote and non-remote that we're in at the moment, it's leading to some challenge, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Absolutely. So, um, uh, and, and with the yachting industry, boat shows have been uh, a nightmare. Uh, there's some that are, are trying to run, getting cancelled, rescheduled, um, and obviously teams and companies are, um, have suddenly been working from home um, or remotely. Um, so, I mean, you co-authored uh, Hashtag Remote Working right at the start of the pandemic. Uh, it became uh, an international bestseller. I believe it was number one in Canada and the UK, and then top yeah. 20 in the US. Um, so what is your best advice on remote working uh, and working effectively when you're behind a computer? So um, I think my best advice is that we need to stay socially connected. And, and I think it was a real shame that they used the term socially distanced because actually we're social animals. So you need to communicate more with your people. And one of the challenges that you'll find is it's a little bit uncomfortable because all of a sudden I'm in your home as the leader and I'm not really certain you'd normally have invited me into your home and it feels a bit like I should just do the work and get out. So you start to just talk about the task. You just talk about the work that you want them to do and you forget all of the things, I, I call it the virtual water cooler. Those moments that you would have had if you were in an actual office where you would engage with the person, where you'd ask what they were watching on Netflix or what they'd done that night. And if you cease to do that, you disconnect very quickly. But not only do you disconnect very quickly from your people, they disconnect from each other because the only place that you set up for them is for them to talk about work and you need them to be able to talk about them as much as they talk about their work. So I guess one of my top tips is I always set up, I happen to use WhatsApp groups, but you can use whatever you want. I always set up for my teams, one that's related to work um, so this is where you go if you want to talk about the work that we're doing and you want any help, advice or collaboration. And then we set up another one, which we call the virtual pub slash coffee shop. And the idea with that one is it's just a social venue. You can drop in and drop out as and when you want to. And just like with any pub or cafe, when you turn up, you don't ask everybody to recap what's been said. So there's no pressure that if you just pop in, you've got to reread the previous three days worth of stuff. But it does allow you to, to stay connected and to give people a common purpose. Yeah, I didn't think about the, um, the kind of intrusion, because uh, people are, um, let's say, very conscious about the backgrounds and things, and you've got all these virtual backgrounds. And when it's just your home, people start to think, oh, uh, maybe I don't want my boss to, to see what, um, what is behind me. Uh, maybe it's a bedroom, a lounge, or um, I don't know, the best or worst place to your house, or just a blank wall. Yeah. But um, yeah, I never, I never thought actually we need to bridge this social side and professional side to actually continue to build that relationship. Otherwise, you, you kind of just become functional. And, and that's, that's, that's really good. I, I saw it because I do a load of um, technical demos. And uh, yeah. suddenly all these experts weren't traveling across the country or doing one or two a day in person. Uh, they, they could do 10 in a day, no worries. Because um, it was just tune into Zoom, do the demo. Um, that's what the technology does, uh, end call, next. Um, and it was really, really functional, but you don't actually build that relationship. So it was really efficient and short term, that was quite good. But at the same time, you don't kind of have this personal relationship, but you don't build that face to face and, sh and social side. Which is so important because we know that we buy from people we know, like and trust. So building that relationship is, is so important. And as a leader, your people are your clients. So if you're not investing in the relationship so that they do know, like, and trust you and therefore want to work with you, they're not going to. And there's a scary statistic that 57% of people who leave, leave their boss, not the organisation. 
So there is a there is a real drive for us as leaders to bear that in mind. So you know, think about the top talent that's ever left your team. Fifty seven percent of it left you, um, and that for me is a that that is always a reminder of making sure that I am connecting with my people that I'm understanding if I'm getting it right or I'm getting it wrong and it's not just what they say but what they don't say so I was chatting with a friend the other day he said oh he was really frustrated he'd gone on this uh, zoom call and um three of the people hadn't turned on their camera um so he was very upset about it and and uh, you know thought it was disrespectful and all the rest of it and I said but what have you done about it <laughs> he was like what do you mean I said well that's a that's a cry for help that's those people letting you know they feel disconnected um, and that would be in, in, a, in a face-to-face environment, you'd see them not giving you eye contact and not connecting. But in a virtual environment, you've got to really look for your cues. You've got to look for the fact they didn't turn the video on. They, they constantly have got ways where they're coming in on voice only, but not anywhere else. It is a way of them saying they're starting to disconnect. And that's not about calling them out on it, but it's about going and having different conversations to see how you can reintegrate them back into the back into the team back into you know being enthused about what it is you want to do and it's also often a, a sign that there might be starting to feel sort of some challenges so you know one of the things that we find as we as we kind of progress is in the first couple of weeks people were feeling so much more motivated because they were getting so much more done and, and you you know as you said in your examples there um they were so much more effective they didn't have all this travel time in that but what i find from clients and also talking to friends and things is it got up to about five or six six weeks in and people were starting to feel a little bit disconnected and when we started talking about it it was because they weren't having any of those social conversations they they were only having task related conversations and um, and there wasn't that same connection and, and back to that piece around you know you leave your boss a lot of them started to have real opinions about how well their boss was doing in communicating with them or not as often was the case so they were getting comms from the company they were getting the facts of what they needed to do but they were missing that communication where you actually went and talked to the person about how do they feel what's that looking like and are you you know are you looking for those signs that maybe they could do with a little bit more support so listening for their tone of voice and seeing whether or not they you know they sound like they're, they're absolutely fine or actually they're not language is an amazing thing so you know i speak to people all of the time and they'll tell me they're doing a, you know doing great everything's fantastic and then you listen to the words they use and they'll say things like well i'm soldiering on we don't soldier on if everything's fantastic <laughs> you know you soldier on when things are a bit of a burden so i think one of the challenges about leading a remote team is you have to use your other senses you have to really listen to the words that are being used and really look for those other senses to give you those triggers that say this person might need a bit more of my support. They might need me to do something else because we know that motivated people work 20% harder. So when we get this right, it works for the whole organization and it works for our people. And then how can they start to address that? So would you go, would you kind of start a Zoom call or even um, schedule a Zoom call that is just a social and come on, um, kind of at the end of work, maybe with a beer in your hand and literally just talk about anything but the projects that are going on. Uh, how can they kind of yeah. address that? Is it quite so, difficult? So I'd, yeah, I'd be inclined to do the first one as a little bit of a virtual um, social gathering slash town hall, a way to tell everybody at the same time um, what's been going on in the organisation. You want to keep them connected to, to kind of the whole company where it is. Yeah. There's probably an element of insecurity with everything that's going on. So the more that you can communicate, the better. Because the other thing is that the human brain, the way it works, is in the absence of a fact, it creates a story. And the story is always much more fantastic than the reality is ever going to be. Um, so the more that you can remind people of the facts, the, the easier it is in times of crisis. Um, so it's communicate more, not less. And then you can do some things to just make people feel more connected. So we did a... Um, virtual pizza party a few weeks ago so we'd arranged for pizza to be delivered to everybody's house um, and then at the point that we knew it, it was going to be delivered between seven and half seven and at half seven we all got on with our pizzas and whatever drink we wanted to hand um, and just had just had a chat and there was a little bit about work but there was a lot more about you know how people were feeling um, 
what had they found had been the thing that they enjoyed the most about lockdown, the thing they'd recommend, whether that was a, I don't know, whether it was a box set, whether it was going for a walk, whether it was um, taking time every day to do something for them, for their hobby. But actually it was a great way to, to share and, and get some banter going, which then meant that when you started to put in, a, a, you, know, you put in the more social elements, people wanted to come along. We've done virtual pub quizzes, um, and some of this doesn't have to be stuff you need to do yourself because you think actually it's already hard and I appreciate right now for the leaders it's harder still because you're having to lead the organisation, you're having to navigate the economy and the environment within which we've got, you've got less time available because actually you know, you've know you got people that are furloughed and things so you're having to deal with, with kind of the same amount of work but um, but less people available to do it. And now you've got somebody like me coming in and telling you that what you really need to do is go and engage with your people and do social events. So I can see how that could be a case of brilliant. What does she know? Um, but I think there are th these parts that say, actually, what can you do to get some stuff that's already out there? So, you know, we go to a virtual pub quiz on a Thursday night that has been, uh, it's free, it's on YouTube. The guy's got 179,000 people that have signed up since lockdown. He launched it in lockdown. But he does, you know, he does the quiz. Um, and actually, all we have to do is arrange to have a couple of teams, which we do, um, who we get in touch by WhatsApp and do a little group WhatsApp call. Um, and then at the end of the night, both calls join each other and we just share which team won. I, I, but it didn't take any effort apart from us spending a little bit of time, but the impact has been significant on how much more connected that we feel um, and it gives you a chance in between the questions to chat about what's going on you know what's it felt like what's it been like so i think there are there are great ways of doing it but i think it's it's having a really clear communication plan and then making sure that you keep communicating and that you keep communicating not just about uh, the facts but the feelings because we we lead with both yeah and it's i suppose it comes down to kind of humanizing yourself because it is it's almost too easy just to become this functional kind of machine that okay is great in the first five weeks but starts to break down because its problems are in the head and it doesn't have this kind of motivation to keep going but um i mean on, yeah. on that point uh, the industry hasn't got these shows anymore it's traditionally very very old school very person to person as you mentioned um so how can companies continue to develop new business and make new connections, meet new people and, and really grow their network, whether it's personal or business network, um, and, and really continue to progress their business rather than shutting down, waiting it out, um, or, or, or worse alternatives? <laughs> Um, so I think, you know, we've, we've started to see the real benefits of virtual networking. Um, so, you know, even though the thought of another Zoom call for a lot of people will have them running for the hills, there is, there is some real benefit in doing so. And actually what you're finding now is a lot of those, a lot of those groups are starting to niche down. So I go to a few global networking events um, and have been really fortunate. You know, I've ended up on podcasts in Australia and New Zealand and that all as a result of turning up on... Um, on somebody's networking event. I mean, and that's how you and I met, wasn't it, on a virtual networking event. Um, so I think it's a case of go to them, even if you think, well, nobody there is going to want a yacht or, or want something that, you know, that I sell, you would be surprised. Because it's not just the people that are there, it's the people that they know. Um, and there are, you know, people are still buying these things. I've got a, a friend who runs 140 WhatsApp groups and puts me in most of them it blows my t <laughs> it's my mind um, but with, but within them a lot of them are really really bespoke so he has got one that is about boating he's got another one that's about luxury goods because people are going to him i mean he's he's globally connected they're going to him and saying you know we still want to buy this but where do we get it from how do we connect so i think it's a case of you know, reaching out to people who've got a network. If anyone wants to reach out to me, you're more than welcome. And just saying, you know, if I can connect you up with somebody who can help, then I will do that happily. But I would just say, go to the networking. Don't pre-assume that nobody there is going to want what you've got. Whenever I go to networking, my assumption is that nobody in the room wants what I'm selling. 
that's not what I'm going for. I'm going to find out a bit more about them and on the off chance that there's somebody in their network that wants what I'm doing. And it changes the whole conversation. Because I'm no longer selling at the people I'm talking to, all I'm actually doing is saying, this is what I do. And if you know anybody that fits this avatar, please do give them my details. And now tell me about you so I can do the same and I can be thinking of, of customers for you when, I'm, you know, when I'm meeting new people. It totally changes the dynamic and people want to connect with you. They want to do, they want to do business or they want to go, oh my God, yeah, I know somebody. Let me put you in touch and that might get you somewhere. So networking can be hard. Nobody, nobody jumps for joy, do they? Not going into a room of people that you've never met and, and just putting yourself out there. Um, and I almost think sometimes the, the virtual way can be better and can be worse. There's a there's kind of a better because it's behind a computer screen. So, you know, nobody likes or engages with you. It's okay <laughs> you don't have to see them again. Um, but equally, and they, <laughs> yeah, it's like block. Um, but you, I mean, obviously, you, but you don't get the same, uh, you don't get the same way of being able to fully get the person's personality to be able to get the, the body language and things. So for a lot of ways, it's more uncomfortable. But I think as with all networking, it's just a case of, just give it a go. Just just go along and kind of meet people and you'll be surprised how much people want to help and, and how you end up doing some of the, seriously, some of the most random things. I mean, I remember being live on a podcast. This one blew my head. It was live Thursday morning in Australia, but I was doing it Wednesday night uh, in my kitchen downstairs. And I was like, right, so I'm live on Thursday, but I've not gone to bed yet on Wednesday. So this makes, this makes no sense. I kind of can't comprehend it. Um, but all of that was off, was off networking. And, and I mean, Ben, you go to networks. Would you agree? Do you think there's opportunity there for people in your industry? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, um, I mean, first of all, that networking technique about, um, speaking to someone as though they're not the prospect, but actually their network is very much the prospect that, um, I'm going to use that <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, these digital networking <laughs> events, they're, they're very good. And, and obviously there's the um, geographical barrier that's just gone. And, and with Yachting being so international, um, actually that's, that's really ideal because I can meet with um, anyone in any country. Okay, we've got the time zone to address, but, um, but I can do that straight away. There's no travel costs. Um, there's no waiting for a boat show and you can really progress business with it. Um, the other day I was on a call with, I, I want to get a picture of this, but the, um, I had a, a guy in Australia, Sydney, Australia, it was myself <laughs> in the UK. And, and then there was a, a guy in Florida in the U S and we're all speaking at once. Um, we met all remotely mm -hmm. the week before and suddenly we've got this and I really want to get a picture of um of something that's like kind of stereotypical of our country and get a and get a picture of us <laughs> on it. I think I'm gonna go for a cup of tea. Um but, uh, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, it'd be great. I mean you can you can do that. And I met loads of people um over the last few months through through this stuff. because uh, it works. And and it's amazing what you find out. I mean uh yacht sales um with the economy and and the type of, of companies these uh high net worth individuals run um, you yeah. might think actually there's no way they're going to buy a yacht um, but actually uh, I speak to a contact in, in Fraser Yachts they've had um, the uh, record break in uh, May this year which was the peak of the um, peak of the pandemic um, for yacht sales charter was down but um, but the yachts are selling um, and it's yeah. it's how you find out these things it's speaking to people and um, and yeah, it grows. It takes patience, takes time, but um, with with patience <laughs> and time, <laughs> it gets somewhere. Absolutely, and it's with consistency. And I think that can be the challenge in times like this, which is you kind of doing you're doing lots of work. You're working really hard. You're being consistent, and it doesn't feel like it's coming fast enough. And then people can go, "Well, I just need to change direction." And often it's just about being um, ruthlessly patient. If you're doing the right things and you know you're doing the right things and you have constantly got the customer in mind, what's the customer going through right now? What are they thinking? 
what actually has changed for them because actually you know if i'm going to be locked down and, I, and i'm somebody who has a yacht i might rather be locked down on a really nice yacht thanks very much than wherever it is i am so far which is why we've seen you know in, in other industries there's been an absolute boon in kind of the caravanning and motorhome business because everyone realized they couldn't go on holiday this year so they may as well do something to change and still go away still feel that sense of freedom so I think some of it is dispelling those myths because what we think about happens. It's how our it's how our brains work. So we have to start thinking of things from a positive psychology point of view. So for every negative, there is a positive. So every time we tell ourselves something in the negative, like, well, it can't be done, no one's going to want a yacht. You have to ask yourself, why would somebody want a yacht right now? Who's that person? What are they interested in? How am I going to appeal to them? What are they thinking right now? What might their challenges be? And change all of your communications to be about that, to be about that desire piece. Um, because people still want something to aspire to. You know, we all know that as soon as we come out of Christmas, everyone books a holiday because we've got to have something to look forward to. It's how we're driven. And the same is true. You know, people are going through this pandemic and they're going, if we come out, you know, actually, I want something to look forward to. And for a lot of people, it has made them question the way that they have been living their life so a lot of people have been saving all of their money ready for their retirement or for some point in their future and this has made people question what if that never comes so what if right now is all i've got and therefore maybe i should be spending it right now and enjoying my life because the only the only part of life that really needs us is our present our past doesn't need us anymore and our future isn't guaranteed. So if we stay where we are right now and make the best decisions we can with what we've got available, that's going to be how we see our lives and our businesses prosper. Yeah, and I think, I think people have um, very rapidly seen how much they value family and friends and, and that time together, um, especially with lockdown, Absolutely. removing that. Um, you suddenly, um, it kind of hits you as in how much you want that and how much you need that to keep going so it's 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 really interesting what's going on but the um do you do you have a do you have a case study of a company that's uh gone through this kind of digital transformation and and started the remote working and done it really really well um so i was working with one organization who um they were absolutely convinced, I've worked with them a couple of times, they were absolutely convinced that under no circumstances could remote working ever work for them. No one was ever going to like do yeah. their job. It was, it was going to be disastrous. They wouldn't be compliant. I mean, you name it. It was, it was, it was a no-no. And it was something they wanted to have happen because they'd got crippling property prices of, the, of their own offices. And then obviously this crisis hit. <laughs> they did go into turmoil and it was like, oh my God, Kim, like what, what? What do, we, what do we do with this? I said, well, let's just come up with a plan. Let's see what can be done because we can't do nothing. We can't just, you can't just shut the door. You've got, you've got clients. So let's talk, you know, let's talk to the clients. Let's let them know what the plan's going to be. And then let's see how much of this we can automate. So we started them off on, uh, on Zoom and they had to do um, a lot of training because people didn't really know how to use it and they didn't know how to use the breakout rooms effectively or how to use polls to be able to, to kind of engage with people. And then once we'd got them kind of going, right, actually I can now interact with customers. It was then a case of what else can we do to take this digital? How do we actually get your entire business online? So how do you make sure that your website allows people to buy? How do you make it easy for people to be booking into your calendar because you've not got any more time? And um, so unless you kind of work through the processes and they were a biggish company, so it was, you know, great for them you can say that's, well, that's ideal because they've got plenty of money but I've also done it for smaller organizations where actually they hadn't got a lot of money and they were probably you know teams of no more than five or six people that they all of a sudden were like oh dear <laughs> everything that was face to face now needs to go online how do I go online my social media probably isn't as slick as it should be I've not got a brand or a message that works in those spaces and um, and how do, you be, how do you stand out? How do you become engaging? Um, and I think a lot of it is learning different skills. So it's, it's always thinking about who is it I'm going to, who is it I'm trying to serve? And what are they thinking? Because 
I think where we go wrong in, in organisations, we think about what we need as the organisation, what's not working for us, and then we try and build our processes around it. Well, that will only ever work for us. <laughs> we have to instead look at it and say, what is it that the client is looking for? What's the easiest and most engaging journey we could create for them? And then work it back and say, how do I make that happen? So I'm talking many, many years ago, but I remember, uh, so I worked for Egg when Egg was first launched and Egg was renowned for being one of the most forward thinking and digital banks of its time. But we had some horrendous processes because we were always designed around the client and what the customer would think. So, so I remember um, we were deemed to be the people that were the first to have cracked getting you um, an online answer on your loan. Right. So that's what people perceived. But the reality is what happened is you clicked through, you did your application. It sent an application to India. They typed it into um, the computer, which sent it to our offices in Derby. The offices in Derby underwrote it, checked what the answer was, sent it across to my team. And we rang you up and went, hey, Ben, great news. Your loan has been accepted. The paperwork will be with you in a couple of hours. Any other questions? And you'd be like, oh, my God, what an amazing service. Behind the scenes, it was string and sellotape. It was ugly. <laughs> um, we, we had challenges where... You know, we, we had to do all of that in a 12 hour window, but it was 12 consecutive hours. And some people thought it meant 12 hours. So it's like, well, I did an hour today. I'll do an hour tomorrow. It's like, no, no, we've got, yeah. like the, the clock ticks. The customer's got 12 hours, not we've all got 12 hours. So you go through all of those challenges. You go through all of those um, teething problems, but it was very easy to get that set up. And then once you'd got it set up, you found ways to automate little bits of it. You found apps that work. For, and these days it's even easier I mean, I'm a complete, and I always say I'm a technophobe, but my friends have decided I'm a tech nerd <laughs> since lockdown um, because I've now learned 49 apps that I use um, because they make my life easier or they make my clients' life easier. Because one of the challenges, particularly on social media, is where do I get content? What, what am I going to say to, to these clients and how do I keep that going? But there are some amazing apps that allow you to do just that. Um, so one of my favorites that I share with everybody is Refind. And you can personalize that to you and your clients. So you, you go onto it, it's free, and you set up the types of topics that you and your, more specifically your client, but also you are interested in, the things that you would like to read about and the types of publications or the people that you would like to hear them from. So for, for me, in my business, it's the likes of Harvard Business Review, the um, Forbes, the uh, Wall Street Journal, as examples. And then what this thing does is every day it goes and scours everything that's out, in, out there in, in the ether and brings you back 10 articles that it thinks matches your audience and your message. So then you kind of can read through them and go, actually, is this good? Is this going to work for my clients? Yes. What's it made me feel? So I can add some value to it by going, I read this, this bit was insightful, but here's the article. So all of a sudden you've got insightful value add information that you're sharing. So you become a trusted advisor and we all know trusted advisor is really important in the business world. And the same is true for, you know, for people that are buying you know, your yachts and, and uh, other products. They want to trust that they're coming to the best, that they're getting an expert. So setting yourself out to be an expert in the digital space is it's a real skill, but you can do it. And it doesn't have to take a lot of money. You can do it from free apps and just connecting with the right people that can give you that knowledge. Yeah. And I, I use that app um, out of your recommendation a few months ago. <laughs> so I, I get apps that, um, that I share so often and look at in the AI tech and what's going on there machine learning and all, all this stuff and information that I can, I can then digest and show my network. And it, it really does work and it's, it's easy. It, it really is easy once, yeah. you, um, once you have the kind of strategy. And um, I'm glad you found it useful and, and right. Yeah. So it's, it's, how you, it's how you kind of get out there, isn't it? Yeah. So you mentioned, you mentioned the trusted advisor. And uh, I know there's a book on that, yeah. that I am, um, I've got three hours and 15 minutes left on it, on the, uh, for audio books. Um, but that moves us quite nicely onto the book recommendations. Uh, I have a few in front of me. Um, if you want to kick us off with two or three, okay. that would be, uh, that would be cool. So what are your top books? Yeah. 
Okay, so, so my first one is called The Big Leap, and it's by Gay Hendricks. Uh, and it really talks about how most of us live our life in our sphere of excellence. That doesn't sound like that's too bad. So your sphere of excellence is where you know you've been paid for something before. So you continue to do it because you know that that's kind of where you're pretty much guaranteed the money's going to come in. But what we need to do is push ourselves further until we find our sphere of genius. And when you find your sphere of genius, that's when you're doing the thing that makes your soul sing. And that's when your results will be exponential. It's a great book. Right, love it. Right, okay, I'll take one. Um, I've got Collaboration is King. Uh, now, this is, this is very much my focus at the minute with collaborating with as many companies and people as I can. Uh, and it, it does link into uh, with what you were saying with the networking. Um, but on a company level, it's uh, if a company has a really strong asset, strong presence, strong brand, uh, if you can work with that, um, you inherit their value. And with what you, you bring to the table, uh, with the value mm -hmm. in your company or as an individual, uh, they benefit from. And so rather than sitting there uh, fighting each other or ignoring each other, um, speak to each other, do some kind of collaboration. It might be huge, it might be tiny, it might be really robotic and passive. Uh, it might take a lot of work, but it, uh, it does open opportunities. Uh, so collaboration is king and um, certainly a recommendation from me. Um, go for it, Kim. Oh, wow. No, it sounds great. I'm going to give that one a try. Thank you. Um, the next one I would say is Crucial Conversations. Um, and it's uh, the foreword is by Stephen um, Covey, but it's four writers. And actually what they've done is talked about the fact that in life and in business and just in general, there are moments when a conversation becomes crucial, when you notice that actually it's become a little bit uncomfortable, <laughs> but perhaps it's starting to feel a bit like an argument. And what happens is people respond in either silence or violence and neither one of those really works. So either they get very irate and raise their voice or they just say nothing and hope it goes away, but neither of those address it. And this is a fascinating book that takes you through how you recreate a safe space for both parties at the point that it gets crucial so that you can actually have a sensible and collaborative conversation where both people come out feeling like they've, they've, they've no longer got a problem, they've no longer got an issue. It's amazing. It's got some fantastic examples and I recommend it to literally everybody I meet. I think I've already recommended it to you, Ben, so sorry. <laughs> No, it's a one. I bet that's quite hard to do at the moment as well, with, without the person-to-person -person and loads of time to do things, um, actually keeping in that space and addressing things really head-on. Um, that's a good one. Uh, so last one from me, I've got uh, the compound effect. I've not started this. Uh, I looked at it on, on Goodreads and got hooked. Uh, and it was essentially, um, if you're doing a task or something that you will then repeat, uh, to get the same value from over and over again. Um, that's not so good if it doesn't compound and doesn't build on the last thing you do um, so that you start getting this exponential growth. Um, but if it does complement on the last thing you did, then you are on the exponential growth and in time you get a huge amount of value for, for things. So when people are assessing their strategy at the moment, whether that's something like personal finance or um, direct in a global company, um, look at the compound effect, see what it's going to become uh, and how you can put those. Uh, it, it is it. Go on, have you got one more? Kim? Um, it sounds like an amazing book. I'll have to give that one a try as well. You always have the best, you always have the best recommendations. So thank you. I'm going to go for that one as well. So my last one is, is an oldie, but a goodie. So think and grow rich by Napoleon Hill. Um, and whilst it's written mainly about money, the principles that are in it are actually about how you, how you basically grow anything in your life, which is about continuing to improve. And also about the power of what we're thinking, because what we think we become and the benefits of finding a group of people who are like-minded and how you grow together. So you become, you know, they say you become a sum total of the five people you spend the most time around. It's around thinking about that when it comes to your business in your business world, who are the five people you spend the most time around from an organizational point of view? And are they pushing your thinking? And if not, go and find a way of bringing somebody else in to, to kind of augment that team so that you can all be 
challenging your thinking and, and I guess back to your earlier point Ben it's it's kind of like building on and compounding what you already know so that it pushes you to the to the next level but it's a it's an insightful book yeah I've I've read that I've read it about one and a half times uh, it is it is a, a really long book right um, so I, I've to into this habit of kind of just having it in the background and then, and if I play it two three times on on audio books I'll pick bits out of it and kind of review bits um, but it is, it is full of good stuff. And it, uh, the first chapter of that, it just explains how to use the book. And it's like, look, this is not yeah. a, a beautiful story. This is just information and content. Don't try and rush through it. It just really digest it because the, there's a lot in it. Uh, all right, so uh, that's all we've got time for today. Uh, you've been listening to Flagship Digital Insights uh, with myself, Ben Taylor, on Yachtin International Radio. We'll be back next week with more digital insights. Uh, your guest today was, was Kim Adele Platt. Uh, do check out her website and everything she does. And thank you, Kim, for coming, uh, coming with, on with us today. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Right. Beautiful.